Okay, here we are now moving into something that should probably be a bit familiar with you, the concept of glycolysis. But before we get there, I started to mention this in the last slide and I realized, ah, in the last lecture that is, I should have put in a slide for this. So here is a graphical representative representation of all the various energy systems. We have our initial, eight, just our ATP stores in the muscle represented in yellow right here. And we can see this is uh, the maximum amount of energy production so this is our total energy production as represented by this black curve right here. And we can see that the time is on the x-axis down here and it's not linear. It goes from two seconds to 10 seconds to two minutes to two hours. So we can see none of them go down to zero. They're always working a little bit at a um, all together. You're never completely anaerobic. You're never completely aerobic. But we can see high intensity very short duration, once again, you have enough ATP stores for about two seconds. But notice as ATP stores start to decrease, creatine phosphate starts to kick in, that phosphocreatine system that's in green here, and that'll start to take over. So now here's my dominant energy system going on to upwards about 10 seconds. It once again lasts a little longer than that potentially. But when that starts to go down, what starts to take over? Oh, glycolytic, glycolysis, what we're going to talk about next. And then lastly, as glycolysis starts to kind of fade away here, what's going to start creeping up and being the dominant one? Aerobic system. So kind of keep this in mind. You might want to revisit this slide um, as we put everything together here. So once again, short, short duration, high intensity, kind of these three, kind of the intermediate, excuse me, these two, kind of intermediate right here and long duration, low intensity here. All right, so let's look at glycolysis. And glycolysis, well, like I always say, it's in the word. So if we look at glyco, it means relating to sugar. And lysis, as I've already told you, means breakdown. So we are breaking down glucose. So a couple things about glycolysis. Just like the creatine phosphate that we talked about in muscles, this happens in the cytoplasm. We haven't gotten to the mitochondria yet. Uh, it breaks down glucose to 2-pyruvate, NADH and two ATP molecules are made, and once again it is anaerobic, it does not require oxygen. And once again, I'm going to go in deeper than the book, and, and deeper than I'm going to test you on, but I want to introduce you to these concepts and start putting these concepts together with metabolism and enzymes and what have you. And there's glycolysis. And no, you do not have to memorize this. No, I know it looks like a, a bunch of le letters and numbers and maybe a bunch of gibberish right now. And you don't need, like I said, to memorize it. In the future, if you take biochemistry, you're going to have to. But for right now, I want you just to understand the process. So just go with me here. First step is we're taking that 6-carbon glucose and we're making glucose 6-phosphate. But notice the enzyme here is hexokinase. Oh, kinase. I know that means what am I going to do? I'm going to add a phosphate. Oh, and there it is. There's my phosphate. But notice whenever we do something like this, whenever we add or take away a phosphate, ATP is involved. And in fact, here we have to invest energy. We have to invest one ATP to make glucose 6-phosphate. So right now we're in the hole, minus one ATP. We're trying to make ATP and we're already starting out in the negative, if you will. But like I said before, you have to invest money to make money. So think of this as a investment in order to make more ATP. The second step is an isomerase. Isomerase, what is that? Oh yeah, that's one of those enzymes that rearranges. And really all we're doing here is we're taking this glucose 6-phosphate and rearranging this ring instead of a six member ring is now a five member ring. So it's just a rearrangement. And notice that the energy difference between these two is very small. So it's virtually the same energy state. So there'd be an equilibrium pretty quickly between these two. But what's going to happen is that fructose 6-phosphate is going to be driven to the next part of our chain by the next enzyme. So it's going to keep pulling to the right, if you will. Now we have phosphofructokinase, what's known as PFK. And once again, in the future, you'll probably have to know a bit more about this, phosphofructokinase. This is one of your main regulatory steps. 
how quickly glycolysis is going to go through. And once again, oh, counterproductive, another investment of ATP. So right now we're minus 2 ATP, which is not looking too good for us. What happens next? Well, right now we have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which means fructose with two phosphates attached. Bisphosphate, right? One on the one carbon and one on the six carbon. Ugh, well, what are we going to do now? Next thing we're going to do is we're going to cut it in half. We're going to form two trioses, two three-carbon sugars. So now we have to follow two different molecules. And notice we end up with two different trioses, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. However, guess what? These two are interchangeable because of this enzyme, yet another enzyme, triose phosphate isomerase. So even though it creates two different trioses, we end up with two of these. This, this one's going to be shifted this way, and we're going to have two of these glyceride 3-phosphates. Still haven't made any energy yet, though. We're still in the whole negative 2 ATP. All right, so when are we going to get some energy out? Oh, well, in this next one, we're going to actually reduce. When we think reduction, we think energy here, okay? And we're going to reduce NAD to NADH. And we saw that before. And when, So here's a high-energy molecule. Yay, we're getting something out finally, a high-energy molecule. All right? But here's the thing with this NADH. It can be only be used in the mitochondria. So we can't use it quite yet. All right, but at least this is positive because in the mitochondria, this one NADH will give us three ATPs. But wait a minute. Notice that we're looking at glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Don't worry about the names. Just realize that everything that happens from this point on is happening twice. Right? There's two of these, which means we'll have two of these for every one glucose. So when I said, yes, this reaction give a, gives us one NADH, but remember, the whole thing happens twice. So we'll end up with two NADHs, giving us six ATPs in the mitochondria. Now we go to phosphoglycerate kinase. Oh, there's that kinase word again. And guess what? Now we get an ATP out. That's a good thing. But remember, it's not just one ATP because it happens twice. So we can put twos all over the place and get twos here. So we have two ATPs. Well, we were started off in the negative two ATPs. I'm not going to count the ADPHs yet. So right now, well, we broke even. All right, we invested two ATPs and we've gotten two ATPs out directly. Step 10, I'm kind of following this around here, so we just went from here to here. Also, I'm just kind of jumping to the end here, this is the last step, is a pyruvate kinase. And step 10 is also going to give us an ATP, two more ATP. So now we're at plus two. So let's summarize this. You, once again, you don't need to know all those details. Let's, let's look at this. It's no oxygen. There are no oxygens needed here. No oxygens involved. It's anaerobic. Glucose has six carbons, right? C6H12O6. We saw that when we looked at carbohydrates. After glycolysis, we end up with two three-carbon pyruvate molecules. Let me go back for just a second. See, here's that pyruvate molecule that I've also mentioned in the past. This is what we finish with, pyruvate, at the end of glycolysis. But once again, two of these. And how many carbons do we have? One, two, three, which makes sense. We started with six carbons. Now we have two three-carbon molecules. But notice, in a weird way, it's almost like we just cut glucose in half. We did a lot more than that. We rearranged stuff. We got some energy out. But I want you to realize there is still a lot of potential energy left in pyruvate. That's the big thing here. Glycolysis breaks down sugar to pyruvate, and it gets a little energy out, but there's still a lot more. The main 
surplus of energy from that original glucose molecule is still in pyruvate and we still want to be able to tap into that. So here's our energy summary. We invested two ATPs in the beginning. We got out two NADHs and four ATPs, which means we grossed 10. So therefore we netted eight. So if we got 10 out, right? And, but we had to invest two, we netted eight. But wait, once again, NADH can only generate ATPs aerobically in the mitochondria, right? So therefore, if you don't have oxygen, because everything in the mitochondria requires oxygen, if you don't have enough O2, if you go anaerobic, absence of oxygen, we only net two ATPs directly in glycolysis. So all that confusing multi-enzymatic work to cut glucose in half, and we're only netting two ATPs directly. But what happens to pyruvate? Remember I said there's lots of energy still in there. And if energy, excuse me, if oxygen is still available, it is gonna enter the mitochondria, it's gonna undergo aerobic oxidation, right? That final energy system, the, the citric acid cycle we're gonna to get to. It undergoes combustion. Electrons are put onto oxygen, all right? Just like, it's literally from a chemistry standpoint, the same thing as burning a, burning a candle. It's combustion from a chemistry standpoint. But what happens if you don't, if a fire doesn't get oxygen, it gets snuffed out. Same thing here. If O2 is not available, it cannot go through that system. So we have to keep on trying to get as much energy out of glycolysis. If we're, if we're working so hard and so hard that we cannot take in and deliver enough oxygen to our working muscles fast enough, well, then we're going to get this backlog of pyruvate. Well, pyruvate backlogs, it backlogs all of glycolysis. I'm oversimplifying. So we have to, in order to keep going and going and going, we have to get rid of that pyruvate. All right, for glycolysis to continue, we have to get rid of it. Substrates have to be replenished. In other words, NAD plus must be replenished. And um, we, have to, we have to replenish those things. Well, how are we gonna do that? It's called fermentation. In fact, you'll hear it called lactic acid fermentation. You'll see it that way in lots of books. And I'll talk about the formation of lactic acid. And I, while I'm saying this right now to you, and you will still see it in a lot of books, I'm going to tell you that more modern research is saying that that perspective is wrong. It's lactate formation, not lactic, lactic acid. And being that this is a biology class for fitness people, I'm sure we've all heard about that lactic acid burn, like lactic acid is so bad and evil, lactate's evil. Well, no, let's really look at it. Whatever happened to lactic acid? Here's what we used to think. Lactic acid was produced after high intensity exercise when we went anaerobic, right? And lactic acid, by its very nature as an acid, would immediately split up into hydrogen ions and lactate, lactate salt. So whenever we trained someone at a high level and then took their blood, we would see that their blood pH actually went down. We actually had an increase in hydrogen ions and we'd see these lactate. So we'd say, oh, it must be lactic acid accumulating. And that's what would cause the muscle acidosis and the burning of the muscles. So lactic acid was a bad thing. Well, what we know now is that actually it's not lactic acid, it's lactate. And there are other reactions throughout glycolysis and other areas that are going on at the same time that produce the hydrogen ions. One of the main ones is just ATP hydrolysis. The breakdown of ATP releases hydrogen ions making the area more acidic, lowering the pH. So under aerobic conditions, the body can buffer it so pH doesn't go too low. In other words, get acidosis. Whenever you the pH starts to go too low, you get that burning sensation and the muscles literally cannot contract as well because it messes up the actin and myosin bonding, which we'll get to that later, okay? But the point being is, you start getting that burning cessation, it's not comfortable, you cannot maintain it, you've hit your red line, and this is where it's important to training. All right, this is where you go, quote unquote, anaerobic, where you've reached your lactate threshold. You'll, you'll hear the terms lactate threshold, um, anaerobic threshold, onset blood lactate accumulation, all different ways of saying basically the same thing 
when are you going to redline? You've reached an intensity where you, if you try to maintain, uh, maintain it, you can't because you've got this acid buildup in the muscles. And once again, the reason when you're, when you're aerobic, the body buffers it very well. But when you go anaerobic for multiple reasons, they can't buffer it. So the important thing here is there is an absolute, absolute 100% correlation, correlation being the key word here, correlation between lactate buildup and muscle acidosis, but it's not a cause and effect relationship. And while I'm saying this to you, I got to point out two things. One is that many books will still not have it this way. And two, that there's still a bit of a debate here. Uh, I think the uh, consensus out there right now is that it was never lact lactic acid. It was always lactate buildup. And some people still say that lactate itself can actually contribute to the effects of muscle acidosis. But the majority of people uh, nowadays, I researchers, I think, believe that it's more of a cause and effect. Uh, excuse me. It's not a cause and effect. It's a correlation. So what happens to lactate? Is it that ever molecule that causes burning? No, we just said that. And in fact, lactate can be used as fuel. In fact, it'll be used aerobically in the mitochondria, in heart, liver, and brain can all use lactate aerobically. Other muscle fibers can muscle, uh, metabolize lactate aerobically. So as long as other slow twitch fibers, um, which actually have the mitochondria, have the oxygen, they can actually take up that lactate and use it. or or that lactate can go to the liver. The liver is an amazing processing plant, chemistry, uh, chemical processing plant. And it can go through a process called gluconeogenesis. Think about it, the word gluco, sugar or glucose, right? Neo, new, and genesis, beginning. So we have new beginning for glucose, basically, it's the reverse of glycolysis. The re virtually, it's not identical, but it's basically the reverse type of reactions to make glucose from lactate. So here's a little animation, and in fact, it's going to refer to lactic acid, I believe, from the publisher, kind of giving you, once again, that overview of glycolysis. Cells derive energy from the oxidation of nutrients such as glucose. The oxidation of glucose to pyruvate occurs through a series of steps called glycolysis. The energy released during these oxidation reactions is used to form adenosine triphosphate, ATP, the energy currency of the cell. The initial steps in glycolysis are the additions of two phosphates to the glucose molecule at the expense of two molecules of ATP. The result is a 6-carbon sugar diphosphate molecule and two low-energy adenosine diphosphate molecules, or ADP. This 6-carbon sugar diphosphate molecule is then split into two 3-carbon molecules. Each of the 3-carbon molecules is converted through a series of steps to pyruvate. During these reactions, electrons are transferred to the coenzyme NAD plus to form NADH, and ATP is formed. Under aerobic conditions, the pyruvate is further oxidized to yield more ATP, and under anaerobic conditions, the pyruvate is converted into lactic acid. All right, so we won't hold it against the, uh, the publisher McGraw-Hill for still calling it lactic acid now, will we?